Okay, so let's keep going with this. So he's been talking, he says in the middle of page one, Paul says that, that being an omnivore, meaning being able to eat all different kinds of foods, um, has a lot of boons, a lot of advantages, but also a lot of challenges, a lot of difficulties. And he's been talking about, uh, at the bottom of uh, page one, all the advantages. Um, but now in the first full paragraph on the top of page two, he's going to talk about some of the disadvantages of being able to eat everything. Um, again, one of the advantages is, and he lists off a whole bunch of different advantages, but one of those advantages of being able to eat anything is what you choose to eat and when you choose to eat it links you to other people connects your community connects you to other human beings uh, you get to participate in a tradition in your origins um, but there's problems too so let's hear about the problems because again remember the omnivore's dilemma means a choice between two different things so there's good and there's bad and you got to make choices all right let's take a look um yet the surfeit of choice surfeit is like too much choice um if the surfeit of choice that confronts the omnivore brings stresses and anxieties undreamt of by the cow or the koala, for whom the distinction between the good thing between the good things to eat and the bad is second nature. So for animals, they have instincts about what's good to eat and what's bad to eat. Um, but human beings, it's more complicated because our instincts, we don't really we have these other things in addition to instincts that are like, well, that's delicious. I want to try eating this complicated, crazy thing. But it raises issues about, is this actually good for me to be eating? Because um, um, they, they know the difference between the good things. Animals generally know good things and bad things to eat. They, 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 they have instincts about what's poisonous and not. But human beings will sometimes choose to do things like, say, smoke cigarettes. They know it's bad, and they do it anyway. And this is part of the omnivore's dilemma. If you eat anything, you might choose to eat things that are bad for you. All right. And while our senses can help us draw the first rough distinctions between good and bad foods, we humans have to rely on culture to remember and keep it all straight. So animals have instincts about what's good or bad. The human beings might need to, like, look it up on the Internet to see if it's good or bad, which is a very different thing than the way animals do it. Um... Okay, so we codify, this means we make rules. We, co we codify the rules, meaning we put the rules in a book. To, like, codify is related to code. Um, we codify the rules, meaning we make official things about what you can eat and what you can't eat. If Jewish people, for example, saying you can't eat pork or shellfish. So we codify the rules of wise eating in an elaborate structure of taboos, that's what's not allowed, manners, that's how we would prefer you to eat, culinary traditions covering everything from the proper size of portions to the order in which foods should be consumed to the kinds of animals it is and is not okay to eat. So we don't, animals may have instincts about what to eat, but human beings get rules. Um, and the rules are, like some animals are taboo to eat, meaning you're not allowed to eat them. Dogs and cats, for example, it is taboo, which is you just don't do that. If you told people, oh, I just ate six cats, they, they would get very upset at you. Because um, in this culture, it is not okay to eat that. That's not necessarily true in another part of the world or in another century. Um, but there's, all, there, there's also manners about like how do you eat things? Do you eat quickly? Do you eat slowly? Um, culinary traditions, the size of portions. Um, uh, th this differs from culture to culture. For example, in America, um, America is really capitalist. We really care about money and value. Um, as a result, a lot of people who are raised in America um, my sister, for example, I went to a restaurant with my sister, um, and she said, oh, this is a really good restaurant. Um, but what she meant by really good was they give you a lot of food for your money, which is one way to think about where you should eat. But for me, I was like, okay, they're giving me a lot of food for my money, but is it very good though? Uh, and it wasn't, um, it was okay. It was okay. It was fine. Um, but it's like, it's, I forgot that, that, that in New York City, when I say good restaurant versus bad restaurant, what I mean is very tasty versus not, but also very expensive. So sometimes I'll be like, oh, come to me with this great restaurant I love. And they'll get there, and they pay a lot of money, and they only get a little bit of food. And they're like, well, this is not a good restaurant. But I'm like, it's a good restaurant because it was really tasty, but it, it is really expensive. On the other hand, you can go to a place where the food is not expensive at all, um, and you get a lot of it, but it's just like, okay. So this is the kind of things he's thinking about here is the, the, the traditions. And, and so one of the things I was saying is portion size. Americans like big portions. When you go when you go to get food in a diner, they give you a lot of food. That's not really true in France, um, where people don't necessarily eat huge plates of food. They eat much smaller amounts of food um, at a single sitting. Um, okay, cool. 
All right. So, so, he's, so animals have instincts, but what we have is a bunch of rules about what you can eat and what you can't eat. Anthropologists, those are people who study human behavior. You can take an anthropology class at BMCC. Anthropologists um, argue over whether these rules make biological sense. Some, like the kosher rules, are probably designed more to enforce group identity than to protect health. So the question is, there, there are all these rules about food. So some people will tell you that the reason Jewish people don't eat pork and shellfish is because it used to be, hundreds of years ago, very dangerous to eat pork and shellfish. They could make you very sick if they were not prepared well. Um, uh, so that there may be like a biological reason not to eat. This is a kind of food that might get you sick. But he says, Paulin says, it really has more to do with keeping group together, right? If you say, you, if you say our religious group can only eat certain kinds of foods, that's going to mean your religious group is going to eat with other members of the religious group. It helps it helps to keep your, your group together because you can, if you can only eat the same foods and you're going to the same restaurants and you're hanging out with each other, it helps your group together. Um, so he says anthropologists um, argue over whether these rules make biological sense. Some, like the kosher rules, are probably designed more to encourage enforce group identity than protect health. But certainly a great many of our food rules do make biological sense. And they keep us from having to confront the omnivore's dilemma every time we visit the supermarket or sit down to eat. The omnivore's dilemma is choose. You can choose what to eat. But the food groups, I'm sorry, the groups of people that eat certain kinds of foods, um, make the omnivore's dilemma easy. Because you don't have to think about whether, if you're Jewish or Muslim, you don't have to think about, am I going to have the pork or not? You're not. <laughs> it makes things easier because your group is caught with some rules about what you're allowed to eat and what you're not allowed to eat. Okay, cool. Well, this is going pretty smoothly. Um, all right, well, let's, let's, let's continue on and, and see how we can do on this. Um, the sets of rules for preparing food we call a cuisine, for example. And the set of rules for preparing food we call a cuisine, for example, specifies combinations of foods and flavors that on an examination do a great deal to mediate the omnivore's dilemma. Meaning you've got a lot of choices, but culinary tradition says this food goes with that other kind of food, and so you have less choice. Um, the dangers of eating raw fish, for example, are minimized by consuming it with wasabi, a potent antimicrobial. So raw fish can be dangerous, um, but sushi is eaten with wasabi, and that helps to keep it safe. Wasabi is like a spicy mustard. Similarly, strong spices characteristic of many cuisines of the tropics, where food is quick to spoil, have antibacterial properties. So there's, there's actually the, the sauces and the, 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 the spiciness um, in different groups. It's not just about flavor. Sometimes it's about survival. It can actually help the, the in the old days, it will keep the food from killing you. Um, the Mesoamerican practice of cooking corn with lime and serving it with beans, like the Asian practice of fermenting soy and serving it with rice, turns out to render these plant species much more nutritious than they would otherwise be. So each culture says, oh, when you eat, when, so for example, sushi. I mean, you can just, you know, if you get good fish, you can just eat fish raw. But in Japanese culture, you eat it with wasabi. And it's traditional. When you get sushi, you get wasabi. They come together. Um, back in the old days, there was a reason for this. It would actually make the fish safer to eat. And he lists off several different things. Um, that There's certain food combinations. When you eat this, you eat it with that. Um, for example, when you get a hamburger, usually there's cheese on it. Um, there's not a reason for that, I think, other than flavor. But some of the things where when you get this, you also get this other thing helps. To, there's biological reasons. Um, so these rules are not just crazy rules. Um, there's actually sometimes reasons for it back in the old days about why that might be. Uh, and again, it, chew, it makes being an omnivore easier because there are rules about what you eat and beat it together. That's less choice because sometimes it can be exhausting to have so many choices. Um, when not fermented, soy contains an anti-rispin factor that blocks the absorption of protein, rendering the bean indigestible. Unless corn is cooked with an alkali like lime, its niacin is unavailable, leading to a nutritional deficiency called pellagra. Corn and beans each lack an essential amino acid, lysine and methylene, respectively. Eat them together and proper balance is restored. So his point, I don't, I'm not getting it. That's science shit, and I'm not getting into that right now, because this is not a science class. You're not going to be tested on science. Um, the point is, is that there are scientific reasons. Some cultures might say, well, when you eat corn, eat it with lime. Well, it turns out that if you eat corn with lime, it makes the corn better for you. Um, okay, cool. I think we're doing pretty good. I'm going to, uh, I think I've hit a stopping point, and I think I might, I might stop. So uh, I think we'll pick this up soon. Okay, see you guys next time.